Welcome to this edition of Prep Chat with Burning with Pennsylvania News. I'm the Life Extension Service. Today we're excited to welcome special guest, um, Dr. Tanya Kuman, to talk about Texas Luther Watch. We hope you enjoy. Good morning. I beat you to it. I was so excited. You Go for it. my part. That's your turn. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Coach Out with Burning with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. We are super glad you are joining us this morning. Um, fun fact, we had a slumber party last night. Um, so if you did not see our Facebook posts last night to know that we had a slumber party because we are together, that is a surefire rule that Emily will give something away today. So make sure that throughout the cup chat that if you are joining us live, comment with your county or the state you're joining us from. We are super excited. Do you want to introduce our special guest this morning? I do want to introduce our special okay. guest this morning because that's get on. also why I'm so excited. So if y'all have been following us on social media, you know that we have a virtual webinar happening tomorrow about cranes. And on the webinar, we're going to discuss both Sandhill and whooping cranes. Um, but today we have Dr. Tanya Hamian with Texas Parks and Wildlife to talk to us more specifically about whooping cranes. And it's not necessarily, Tanya, tell us a little bit about your role because you're not necessarily a whooping Wait. crane specialist, but Time you out. are a what? Time out. What? What about people who don't know which crane is which at this point? Oh, should we go over that real quick? Tanya, you want to? Okay, so, so introduce do, yourself and give us a quick rundown of, of which, crane we're, which crane we're talking about. Okay, so my name is Tanya Homayun, and I work with Texas Parks and Wildlife in our wildlife division. And specifically, I am with our Texas Nature Trackers program. So we do what's called community science, which is where we get people from all over the state, whether you are a longtime Texan, a person who's just gotten here, or whether you're just passing through on vacation or something like that. Um, we are engaging everybody in the state of Texas in helping us learn more about our native plants and wildlife. So as such in that role, I do not specialize on birds or where my, my heart is, but I will fully say I am not a whooping crane specialist. I am not a sandhill crane specialist, but we are going to be talking about one particular project that we have that people can assist with, which is called Texas Whooper Watch, which is specifically focused on collecting observations on whooping cranes while they're here in the state of Texas. So can you tell us a little bit about the history of that project? Like how did it start? And then what, what is the project? Sure. So, so this project actually predates my time with Texas Parks and Wildlife. So it was kind of exciting to be able to get to go dig back into the archives of everything, which, um, it literally, you know, reminded me of, so if any of you guys will pop culture moment here, and I'm totally dating myself, but um, the scene at the very end of Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, where they go into that big storage room and they pan out and it's like boxes and boxes and boxes and crates. And that's a little bit what our, um, our storage facility looks like. And so it was pulling, <laughs> pulling the archival box for Texas Whooper Watch and flipping through and finding some of these really cool reports from years past, which when I tell you the date, you're gonna be like, really? Um, so what actually was kind of the genesis of this project was in the winter of 2011 into 2012, there were all these reports that were coming in uh, to various birding circles about a group of whooping cranes that were actually spending the winter at Granger Lake in Williamson County. So if any of you are um, not as familiar, familiar with the geography of Texas, if you picture in your mind where Austin is kind of straight in the middle of Texas, Williamson County is the county just to the north, and there's this really beautiful um, open space there called Granger Lake, and it's overseen by the Army Corps of Engineers, and it is not one of the traditional places where you expect whooping cranes to spend the winter. Most of them make the journey all the way down to the Texas coast, where they spend the winter in Aransas National Wildlife Refuge. So this was kind of shocking. And it really raised the question, as this recovery plan continues and as these birds build up their population, at some point, you know, what if we run out of space at Aransas? Well, the birds are going to be looking for additional places to spend the winter. So that's really cool. So we want to know more about that. So that kind of was the start of this project and Texas Whooper Watch was started. And back at that point, it was all done via paper or sending in an email or calling in to an actual landline hotline to report your sightings. 
So, Whopper watch. Pretty I much, like yeah. Um, so at this point, there is no more 1-800 number and we've done away with the paper forms. And so in 2013, the team started to think a little bit more about how they might be able to use some digital tools and um, collect different kinds of the same basic information, but add in maybe some photographic evidence as well, which could then be used for a variety of different purposes. So in 2013, the Texas Whooper Watch uh, project was started on as a project on iNaturalist. And we can talk a little bit more, maybe if folks are unfamiliar with that, how that works. Um, but basically, it allows people to log into the iNaturalist website and log their observations there, where they immediately get uh, put into the project instead of having to go through the mail and then wait to be processed and all of that good stuff. So it's kind of this real time uh, return on data, which is pretty cool. And so that is where the project is currently housed today. That's cool. That really makes me want a 1-800 number for burning with extension. 1-800. <laughs> no, you don't. Burning with extension. No, you don't. I think that. we do. <laughs> I don't know who answers it, but I just that's want the, the 1-800 number. That's the part I'm concerned about. You guys got to first, first you have to plan the whole music. You got to get just the right. Oh, the whole music. The whole that music. would be more Thank you for holding. Lines. Elevator type music. Yeah. She always does the background music for all of our programs. So yes, uh, you can pick the background music. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So it may just be one eight hundred number with background music that no one ever, <laughs> ever answers. answers. <laughs> might be the might be the case in point. Okay. So wait, wait, pause. Oh. Don't go. I do want you to talk a little bit more about iNaturalist because we probably have lots of people here who are familiar with eBird. Can you talk just a little bit about how it's the same or different or why people maybe should do both? Sure, absolutely. Um, so I just want to say right off the bat that eBird is our gold standard for community science for bird data. It is used in conservation planning. It's used in research projects. I use it all the time and have in previous jobs where I've gotten questions about, uh, you know, when, when can I expect my um, American goldfinches to show up for the winter? And, you know, where are you coming? Where are you asking from? Like, where are you? And I can quickly go into eBird and kind of get a sense of historically when typically that is. So, so many different uses. I use it personally when I'm out looking for birds. So absolutely, we encourage people to, if you're an eBird user, please keep submitting your data to eBird. One of the cool things that I do want to point out that is still, to my knowledge, at least on iPhone, not available on the eBird app is the ability to upload photos. To do that, I think you still need to go through the website in order to add media. Because uh, I ran into that just recently where I was in the field and I actually had an SD card that I could plug into my, you know, an adapter into my phone. And I'm like, oh, I can't update, put this in immediately because I know I'm going to get called on it because it was a rare bird. Um, so just know that if you've never taken advantage of that, and if you mostly do eBird lists through the app, that if you do get some really good photos or some sound recordings, um, it might be, I would encourage you to take a little extra time to also log in through the website and upload those there so that you can kind of create a richer, um, data set in addition to the list that you have kindly submitted. So iNaturalist works a little bit differently and I see a role for it in the bird world when we're talking about maybe specific types of information. So we actually have another iNaturalist project that we use to track uh, bald eagle nests and golden eagle nests if you find them, but it's mostly bald eagles right now. And specifically, we're not so much interested in a free flying bird we're interested in the specific point location of that nest so that we can actually get that into our um, natural diversity database, which is used for a variety of different conservation and planning uses. So that, that pinpoint location on the nest is very important to us. And also it's of a nest. So photographic evidence to go along with it is really important. So when we have a project like Texas Whooper Watch that's running in iNaturalist, it's really anchored by photographic evidence. And so those photos give us a lot of information that simply a checklist would not. It also gives us a way to verify the observation and make sure that it really is, especially if it's through, it, through a spotting scope and it's really distant that we can verify that it is in fact a whooping crane and not a sand hill in some really bright light or you know, even uh, kind of a, a <coughs> trick of the 
perspective that it might actually be something like um, if it's in flight, like pelicans or something like that. So that's a little bit different. iNaturalist doesn't work with checklist. It doesn't do checklists. It does a single observation anchored by photographic evidence. And the cool part about it is if you're brand new and you don't know what you're looking at, there's a whole community of users that can help you with identification. So I see eBird as, a, as the gold standard that you eventually wanna to get to, but if you're just starting out and you're just learning your birds or plants or anything like that, iNaturalist is a really great way to kind of get started, get learning, get involved, and then we'd love to see you guys start putting stuff into eBird as well. Sorry, that was a lot. <laughs> No, that was That's a okay. great point. That's like, perfect. you know, I think that was the best explanation I've ever heard of iNaturalist mm -hmm. being a single observation with a with photographic evidence. And I think that you hit really the big difference between the two platforms there and um, could really clarify some things up. So fun. I don't know. We've never done this before, but if you are on Facebook, give us a thumbs up, a like um, if you use both. And that way we kind of know how many of you out there are, or give us a heart if you use both. If you use one or the other, give us a thumbs up. So um, use your reactionary. We're going to make, will, will that work? Because it won't just go in the whole video? Or should they comment and be like. No, no, like, both. see, look. Right oh, now. Oh, oh. See, you don't, you, okay. you never. I never have them both. You never yeah. are this side. So we've got at least one thumbs up if they use one. Oop, a uh, couple hearts that they use both. Okay, see, Tanya, cool. I have a confession to make. Uh -huh. When I use iNaturalist, like probably a good 90% of my iNaturalist entries are plants and insects that I don't know what they are. Yeah. Because I definitely rely on that, <laughs> like having people from the community. And I try to make sure they're good pictures, right? Because then they're being reviewed. But that is, I am terrible at being like, oh, here's something I know of. Of those things, there's probably like a handful of frogs on there that I'm like, I know what this is. I'll contribute it to iNaturalist. But the vast majority, it's just a good point to point out of like helping get ID on things you don't know. Cause I'm like, oh, cool bug. What on earth is that? And I put it in our naturalist. So that's my, so, that's how I use I naturalist. That's your confession. I'm sorry. That's my confession. So, yeah. so that's like, that actually segues into a really great point, which is if you, if you are, if you are just starting out in any, and I naturalist is different than eBird in that it takes data on everything. Mm -hmm. If it's um, something in the world of the living, so it's not going to help you with geology, mm -hmm. but anything from, you know, plants, animals, fungi, even I've seen people do stuff under microscopes and post those kind of pictures. But one of the things that's different, again, from the two platforms is that there's kind of a, a chat, if you will, that's associated with each observation in iNaturalist. So if you have a question, and I do this all the time, and so bless the gracious people who, who mm -hmm. answer my questions. But sometimes I'll put a question in there and say, I'm really not sure if it's this or that. Can anyone give me some tips? And because of the way that iNaturalist works, it gives people an opportunity to give you that information and feedback. Whereas again, with eBird, you're submitting a checklist that gets reviewed, but there's not that opportunity in the platform for people to kind of have a conversation or discussion back and forth. Good points. Good points. Okay. So let's go back to whooping cranes and whooper watch. You know, I do kind of feel, um, I guess I should give it, we should give everyone a slight apology for completely craning out their social media the past a couple of days um, as we were getting ready for um, our program on is it Thursday, Thursday, mm -hmm. Thursday. Tomorrow. That's tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, it is. It is tomorrow. Sorry. I'm just my days. Everybody, okay, so, um, but why are whooping cranes endangered and how does Whooper Watch really contribute to their conservation? I know you kind of talked about it earlier about um, the second point there in Matagorda County and Williamson, no, in Williamson, Williamson County. County. Yes, yeah, no, I'm just, it is morning, guys, and it is a rough morning. Um, so, anyways, fill us in. Sure. <laughs> Um, so you'll, so making a shameless plug again for the webinar, you guys will be um, getting, I'm sure, a lot more information in detail about the history of the conservation efforts and recovery efforts. So I'm going to kind of just do broad brush on that. But by the time we get to the early 40s in the United States, there, there were literally fewer than 20 birds left in the flock that we think of as kind of our, our whooping cranes that migrate from 
uh, Wood Buffalo National Park in Canada, which is mostly in what's called the Northwest Territories down into a little bit of Alberta. So it's a long flight for these guys to, to be making. And they come down to the Texas coast. So we were down to 20 birds. That's a huge bottleneck. And at that point, um, there were an additional six cranes that were, I think, left alive in Louisiana. So the global population at one point had gotten down to only 22 individual birds. So that's probably about as dire a conservation crisis as you can get. So it's like, how did this happen? How did we get there? So through the history, there's a lot of knotted and tangled history to bird conservation in the Americas, but it came down to the same things that were happening to a lot of our birds, loss of habitat, um, unregulated hunting was another big issue. And quickly that just um, pulled those numbers down. So you're talking about um, today, we're still dealing with those challenges. Again, the loss of coastal habitat, um, their breeding grounds up in Canada are fairly well protected, but again, there are some kind of big overarching threats that um, that you know all these birds are facing, such as you know changing climate, um, again changing. Uh, certainly in Texas, we can protect land, but if it ends up underwater or you know something drastically changes in that habitat, it's no longer suitable. So in fact, Aransas National Wildlife Refuge was formed in the late 30s to actually protect that specific habitat for cranes. So that's another kind of cool thing to think about when you go down there and visit. Um, so today there are now, thanks to those recovery efforts, over 500 individuals in that wild flock that does that, that long distance migration. And so there's a variety of different kinds of research that are going on. So there's actually a community science project in Canada where they're asking people to help find new places where nests are turning up. And so cool. again, biologists can only be in so many places. So there's always constant research and monitoring that's going on on the Texas coast by biologists. And so we're kind of fitting our project into a little bit of a niche where we're asking those, continuing to ask those questions about where are the birds stopping over in the state of Texas during migration? Mm -hmm. because those are important areas too for them to forage as they're making their way to the coast or back up to Canada. And then one of the really interesting questions is as that population grows, you know, as we pass, you know, we've broken that 500 mark. So, you know, it's awesome. Sky's the limit, but where are those birds mm -hmm. going to be expanding out into a new wintering habitat? And so that's one of the things that we're really interested in trying to get more information about how many years do they, you know, are they repeatedly using some of these areas? Are they kind of blipping in and out on the map? Um, do we see kind of consistency through the season? Are they spending just a little bit of time there and then going to Aransas? And again, it's kind of hard to, to know um, unless you're getting some really detailed information on individuals, but broadly speaking, this information is really important for us to know as we continue to go into um, the future and these birds population continues to grow. So that's the role that we're playing. We're interested in where are these birds stopping over during migration and where are they expanding um, throughout Texas it, during the winter as they spend their winter months with us. That's interesting. You know, I, I think um, the key to this whole pup chat may be that we need to go to Canada. And then that we need to go to Rangers National Wild, but wildlife. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. The second one yeah. is more doable. And I should have noted. Whoa, I whoa, whoa. Why yeah. is going to Canada not doable? Well, you know, it's not that far. Do you want to go right now? You know no. what she's talking about? How cold it is? No, I don't want to go now. Summertime yeah. would be great. <laughs> But Aransas is also migrate with the cranes. Uh, with the cranes. That's, that's what we could do is we could track them. We could drive under them as they that's fly. Like a whole different job that is not the direction I took as a wildlife biologist. Just so you know. But like it'd be a fun road stuff. trip. We've done road trips, trips before. Yeah. It'd be a long road trip. Long road trip. That'd be a very long road trip. You could go with us. <laughs> I'm I'm down. I, you know, it's like you have like, but we have to get like a special van. You know, like they have a storm chaser van. We'd have to get like a special crane van with like. And I, I can mean, wear the I crane vote. suit. It would give yeah. us a reason for me to actually buy a crane suit, Maureen. So yeah. that way I could tell them we need to sleep. Come lay down with me. I could jump up and down out in front of their flight. Come lay down here. Yes. Okay. So like a, a crane nap. suit onesie. What, yeah. what was that? A crane suit onesie. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. I think it's going to be hot for next season. 
Um, <laughs> oh, look, Barbara's in on the road trip. And speaking oh. of Barbara, our um, Barbara is our birding buddy for Birding the Hills. And so we guess we should kind of give her a good clap out loud today. Uh, over the past couple of weeks, she's got like two lifers. Yes. She is on the road, dedicated. Way to go, Barbara. Um, clap, clap for you. Definitely. And yeah. Enjoy your life or pie. Um, except for the one in the box from 7-Eleven. Um, I, I, I challenge you to do better next time. I feel, I have, I have a belief that you could have, I, I feel like you could. Mm, I feel like maybe you need to make her a pie. No, <laughs> I assure you, I don't need to do that for anyone. Um, okay. So let's talk. So interesting, fun fact, we got an email yesterday and again, we are completely off, off of our morning routine here, but it's okay. So Sheila um, from Austin, uh, Capital Area, Texas Master Naturalist, sent us a video of crane, cranes migrating over Austin. Um, she, not going to lie, Sheila, I have not looked at the video yet, so I don't know if they are being craned or sand cranes, but... Is this something that someone should upload into Looper Watch? Oh, you've, you've like got the one thing that, and actually this is a great opportunity to kind of talk about the workaround. So mm. iNaturalist will take yes. photo formats as upload, but if you want, it won't allow you to upload traditional video formats. So if you have like a clip of, you know, stuff that you want to show, if you can clip that and save it as a GIF, which is technically an image file, then you oh. can upload that. That's your workaround for video. So you can't post like a really long <clears throat> GIF necessarily, but if you have like a snippet, then you can, um, if you can save it as a GIF, I believe you can still upload it to iNaturalist. There used to be a whole project dedicated to just like people's observations as GIFs, which was really fun. So, um, <clears throat> but yes, in short, even <clears throat> if you have like a still photo of the birds in flight, and you're able to say, I was standing right here when I saw them pass over, that's important and useful information. So absolutely share that. Well, and I'm going to um, take your work around a step further because there might be some of our listeners who don't know what a GIF is. So like some people don't know what OG means. I know what OG means and I know what a GIF is. <laughs> I knew Thank you knew what a GIF much. is, but some of our listeners are not gonna know what a GIF is. Um, and so instead of a GIF, could you take a, um, yes, see, Sheila, maybe I can find a teenager to show me how to make a gift. Um, <clears throat> I'm pretty sure they were sand tails. Okay, so at least she watched her own video and knows what they were. But we hadn't gotten around to watching it this morning with Sheila. Um, so you can also take a screenshot of your video as it plays on your iPhone. Um, and so I'll, one button here and one button here, click at the same time. If you have a new iPhone, I don't know how to work that. Okay. So oh, you'll have to talk to a teenager. It's, um, We're I'm, not a te- I'm not a teenager, but I do this all the time. Um, it's the, it's two of the, it's the power button and one of your two volume photos pressed at the same time or volume buttons pressed at the same time. And gotcha. that will do it. And I always mess it up and turn my phone off or, you know, turn mm-hmm. off the screen. So uh, don't worry if it takes a couple of shots, but that's, that's yes. how you can do the screenshot there. Okay. No. Okay. No. Get back on track because okay. I have okay. obviously. We'll get back to back to whoopers. So, well, this is it ties in because we were just talking about something like a like a video or a single observation. What is if somebody sees a whooping crane? What data are worth reporting? Like, is it if I see one crane one time in one random location, or do you want people who are like I'm at Aransas and I counted ten cranes today? Like, what you want all of that, right? Or you want Emily and Maureen to drive to Canada and follow them? and report all that data, right? Yes. I mean, I'm not speaking. Now I have to say the official caveat, I am not speaking for the state, but like, I'm just saying like as a fellow birder and as I support you, um, you. but in our official capacity. So what I will say is if, so sometimes that one-off information, like if you happen to, you know, be birding and you're like, whoa, whoa, that is a whooping crane. And you get some, you know, again, Um, location information and pictures that is it could be that the bird is stopping over it could be the beginning of a sign that we've got a new area of interest for these birds so even if it seems like it's a one-off that's really useful Um, so the question about Aransas we get that question actually a lot and they're like well if everybody knows what these birds have had for breakfast because they're so well studied 
Um, one of the things I'd say again, because a lot of times people are seeing them on birding tours or things like that, or in observation areas where they can actually get really good photographs of the birds, that information may turn out to be really useful um, in different kinds of research because oftentimes people are able to get really good images of groups of birds and they're able to get images of the birds with their identification information. So that kind of information, who's where, when, who's spending time with who, and especially if you can get something where a researcher can identify, oh, that's bird number so-and-so, and they're spending time here and the family group is still intact or, oh, look, some, you know, <clears throat> there might be some other interesting behaviors going on. You never know how that information might become useful to someone. So we encourage people to submit that information as well, even if it's coming from the heart of Whooper land in, in Aransas. Wait, okay, so talk about the identification real quick. Talk about um, the bands, and I don't know that they also have the tagial tags, and what uh, which what percentage of birds are, are uh, marked? Ooh, I'm going to have to pass on that question because I do mm -hmm. not want to misspeak on that. Okay. Um, and I feel like there's a really strong risk of me getting that one wrong. Um, okay, so then let's I'll go to the Emily's quantitative terms of not percentages. Are most or a few of the birds identified? My understanding is that there are a good number of these birds that, that should have some kind of identification on them. Now, the tricky part is, can you actually see it? <laughs> um, so if anybody's ever tried to look for bands on birds and we <clears> have <throat> other, you know, another project that's running where if the weather's not quite right or the angle's not quite right, you just can't see those bands. But with whooping cranes, you think, oh, well, they got those nice long legs. That should be easy. You mm -hmm. think it would be not always easy. They're often standing in habitat that may obscure that. So in times where you can get that nice clean shot that, that you can see everything you need to see in order to make an identification of an individual, that's absolutely brilliant. So again, with um, when with a population that is actively being managed like this, um, I believe that there's a, a really good number of these birds that are gonna have that kind of identification. And some of them you may even see have um, additional swag on them to um, actually allow for some um, telemetry tracking as well. Oh, nice. Yeah. So are, they, are the marks, are they, do they have bands, amphitagial tags, or are they just bands? I believe they're just bands, but again, I don't want to commit to saying that because I'm okay. not going to lie because I haven't seen as many, you know, like pictures of the birds just kind of standing there um, showing you the, the tags. But again, just the way that they're, they're out there foraging, because I know you'll see <clears> the casual <throat> tags on things like um, pelicans or pelicans. things like that. I've helped put them on pelicans, so that's what it jumped into my head. Is um, on the telemetry, are they, are those backpacks, do you know? Ooh, that's a good question. You're asking hard questions. Sorry, I, I, do, like, I don't. I, I hate. I hate giving wrong information, so I'm really cagey about this. Even if I'm like, well, I think it might be. So I appreciate again, that. it's okay. Like that, but these are like fantastic. These are more reasons for all of y'all in the viewing audience to go get on mm. that get on that webinar because these are great you questions. Are that... marketing coordinator. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sonia. Yes. Yeah, sure. But seriously, I'm, you know, I think that could be a really great opportunity to get an insight into how this whole process has worked. And again, we're just doing kind of one particular slice of it, but there's so much awesome, I think, interesting and little cool details about how we went from, you know, less than 25 birds to now having a population of over 500 in, in this, just this one flock. So. Thank you. That's a good point. So I like this question a bunch. This is one of my favorites. Okay. okay, so we have viewers from all around the state. And um, so some are most likely not going to see a weeping crane in like Abilene, per se. Um, what other projects does Texas Parks and Wildlife, can you highlight that benefit our conservation? Wow, because that is a it that's we're a, not gonna, we're not gonna, we're not going to see a weeping crane, weeping crane today to document. We are. Yeah. Very impressed. Oh. You asked a huge question. So what projects does the, the agency have to benefit conservation? We try to have it's all of Texas Nature Tracker. Yeah. Your okay. favorite Texas Nature Tracker handful. Okay. Um, so the easy way to find, we have 12 what we call long-term taxonomic projects. So we have 
if you're and there's something for just about everybody. If you're into uh, herps, like amphibians and reptiles, we have a Herps of Texas project. If you are into birds, we have a Birds of Texas project. We have Whooper Watch, and we also have uh, one on tracking red crown parrots in the valley, and also mm. one tracking eagle nests. Um, so you can find all of these different projects. We have one on bees and wasps, if you're into that. One on uh, documenting where milkweed is growing in the wild. So we have these 12 projects that are actually all listed in one place on our Texas Nature Trackers page. So if you go to Texas, if you just go to Google and Google Texas Nature Trackers, and it will take, it should take you to the obnoxiously long URL. That's why I can't share it because it's just. I hard. just shared it in the comments. Everybody oh, perfect. That's covered. Awesome. So you'll notice there's three little tabs and one of them is for projects. And if you click on the projects tab, that will show you um, links to, to over to iNaturalist where you can see each one of these different projects. So those are just long-term projects. But I have to say, if I had a favorite type of project in iNaturalist, it would have to be one of our annual bio blitz projects that we do, which is called the City Nature mm -hmm. Challenge. So that one is actually coming up in the spring. And I think sometimes people feel intimidated about joining an official <clears throat> data collection project and like, I don't, I don't know, I'm kind of new to this or I'm curious about it, but I just, you know, I don't know if I can really kind of commit. Well, what's cool about a BioBlitz is you don't have to commit. You just have to make the observation at the right time in the right place. You can do it one time. You can stick around for, you know, keep doing stuff for four days and, you know, hopefully you'll get interested. But what that project City Nature Challenge does is it kind of links us up um, with a larger global community of people who are making observations in and around their cities and suburbs. So the places where we live, work and play. So it helps us document biodiversity of all kinds in those areas. And one of the things I think that's really cool, we have 15 project areas this year that are active in the state of Texas that'll cover about 90 counties. But there's a big global project too that even if you don't live in one of those counties, you can contribute to that one. So your observations anywhere in the world will count. But I think that's the cool thing that I, I really like about it is it's happening at the exact same time across the planet. And so we're all kind of joining together from you know, one end of the planet to the other, documenting biodiversity at a time when the threats to biodiversity are themselves really global. And so to me, that's just really powerful. And I I think it's cool that we can kind of have that, that kind of intention, um, you know, connection of intention and connection of data from, you know, one end of the planet to the other. So that's my personal favorite project. That's cool. That's cool. So 15 <clears throat> areas this year are yes. participating. That's awesome. Okay. And because it's kind of increased a little bit each year, right? Yep. Okay. Yeah, that's awesome. So definitely, especially if you're in an urban area, check out your city nature challenge. Um, and if you're not able to, please do go check out our long term projects. They are running all the time, just constantly there for and if you have old observations, it doesn't have to be current. If You've got old photos that you're like, ah, I had some really kind of cool stuff from like five, 10 years ago. That's you can absolutely put those into both iNaturalist and our projects as well. So, so question. So on the iNaturalist and your project. So if I have a picture of a whooping crane, I need to put it in iNaturalist and in your project. It doesn't just automatically grab it. That's important to highlight. That is everybody. absolutely correct. Yes. So those projects are set up differently um, because specifically we're, because they're, we're collecting data all across the state, including areas where we'd love to have private landowners share their observations with us. So if we have someone who has a horn lizard, on their property and they want to share it with Herps of Texas, we want to have it set up in a way so that they can volunteer to share that with us um, as opposed to it kind of automatically being pulled in. And then there are also some privacy settings that sometimes people want to use, but it create basically still allows us to get as the you know researchers on the project, we can get that information for research purposes, but it kind of makes it you know, less obvious to the general public. Um, so we often find that that appeals to, to some of our landowners. And also um, there are some other benefits to that type of project, but yes, what it does mean is that when you get it into iNaturalist, there's one extra step where, uh, and you do have to join the project first, 
get it into iNaturalist, join the project, and then also add that project or add that observation specifically to that taxonomic project. Well, that's a neat thing. And, you know, talking back back a couple months ago or whenever it was about a bird or bucket list, you know, that's the, or a bird or resolution, you know, maybe that's and then if you are looking for a birding resolution for next year um, is to participate in one of Texas uh, nature trackers um, specific projects. So, you know, there's birds of Texas, if you want it to be broad, um, Wooper Watch, um, Red Crumb Parrot, um, the, the, the Texas Eagle Nest. So those are some specific birding ones like she talked about. And so that one might be a good birder bucket list or birding resolution um, to join. It's also a good thing like to remember if you're going to go somewhere, like if you're like, oh, I'm going to go to the Whooping Crane Festival next spring, join the project before you go. So you're like all ready to get your observations in there. So it is, um, we are over time, which is typical. typical. Um, but as our last question, um, and I don't, Tanya, if you don't have an answer, it's okay. Um, but for all of us, what, are, what program are we most excited or what presentation are we most excited to hear about tomorrow on our upcoming oh. with Crane seminar. So if you don't, if you haven't looked at the agenda, Tanya, no rocks, it's okay. I'll tell you mine okay. because I want to go first so you don't steal it. Okay. So I'm most excited about hearing about the experimental populations um, and kind of understanding how that works and how well that is going, whether they see really good results from that or so-so results. Um, so that's the, that's the piece of the puzzle I'm excited to hear about tomorrow. Okay, I am very excited to listen to um, all of them. <laughs> I just had to do that for your reaction. Okay, I, uh, I'm especially excited to hear um, Emily Wells' presentation. She works um, with the Nature Conservancy in California. And for one, I'm interested because she is going to talk about how they use, they work with agriculture and sandhill cranes and how those things interface and use it for sandhill crane conservation. But I'm also interested because she did her master's degree at Texas and Kingsville, and now she's in California. And when we were emailing, she shared with me that there's some similarities that she sees. And so I'm just really curious. I mean, we talk about like, it's going to sound mushy, but we talk about birds bring us together. Right. And so I'm, I'm <laughs> curious mushy. to learn about how her experiences like, you know, Texas, she's, she spent time in Texas and now she's in California. And I want to hear about how that is kind of similar. I'm here. I'm very excited to hear about that. So, okay. Tanya, do you, have you looked at the agenda? Do you know? I, I had not looked at the agenda and I have to confess, I will not be, I myself will not be able to attend during the, during the live. Are you guys recording it? We are recording. You brought up a point. If you, okay. we're gonna hire you. <laughs> <laughs> if you can't attend live, register anyhow, um, because that recording will be made available to you. And for everybody who registers, whether you watch it the first time or not, you'll get a link. It's just a password protected link that you can, if you've paid, you can go in and watch it at any time. So um, cool. but since you haven't looked at the agenda, you can do one very important thing this morning. We are going to give away free live access uh, to the UpPost with Crane Seminar. Uh, to any of you who joined live and commented on the Facebook this morning. Um, so we've had eight different people comment with their city and state. I know there's more of you watching, FYI. I, it tells me how many of you actually watch and how many have actually commented. Um, so I guess y'all just don't want to win the giveaway this morning. But um, so one through eight, pick a number, any lucky number. And even if, unfortunately, if you've already registered, um, thank you. Um, you get, no, if they've already registered, they get free access to the next one. Oh, we can do that. Yes. Good job, Maureen. Thanks. Good job. Okay. So one through eight. Uh, six. Six. Okay. Let's do the scroll. One, two, three, four, five, six. Our good friend, Terry Hibbets. <laughs> yes. So, okay. uh, Terry, we will be sending you the code and the link to register for, uh, to watch Up Close and Cranes with us uh, tomorrow night. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Tanya. Um, this was fun. It got me, I was already excited for tomorrow, but now I'm even more excited for tomorrow. Um, and so we, yeah, we appreciate you spending time with us. Cool. Well, thanks for inviting me to, to come wake up this morning with you guys. <laughs> Yes, yes. It whoever is. thought this was a good idea at 730 <laughs> was not necessarily the smartest individual, but it works out well. It gets our it's, Wednesday started early. It's kind of hilarious because everybody's like, well, you're bird people, right? Don't you get up like really early? And it's like, okay. 
there's a big difference between like doing this with binoculars and being like bird versus trying to form sentences, which is often challenging. So. It's so true. <laughs> yes. Yes. There's a wake and then there's like a wake. And for right. Snapchat, you have to be awake. So it's a yeah. little bit different. So okay. Well, thank you for joining us, everybody. Have a great week. And we hope to see lots of you tomorrow. Yes.